Amen. That is good news. He is risen. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. In, in all sensitivity, um, I've been to a lot of funerals. I have officiated at a lot of funerals. Uh, but there's one uh, kind of recurring theme throughout all the funerals that I've ever been to. They didn't get back up. And we're here this weekend to celebrate the one who got back up. We're here this weekend to celebrate the greatest event in all of human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're here this weekend to celebrate the fact that Jesus is undefeated, that Jesus is not a dead man on a cross, that he's not a buried man in a tomb, that he is not a baby in a manger, that he is the resurrected, glorious Savior King of all kings, defeated death, hell, and the grave, and every mountain that could possibly stand in our way. And he rose again, and he took the keys of death and hell, and he ascended into heaven heaven and he's coming back and that's who we're here for this weekend that's good news and here's the here's the deal I get it about Easter a lot of people just kind of walk around sad and gloomy I get it uh the, the Jesus on Friday is on a cross it's a sucker punch to all of creation uh creation doesn't know what to do when the creator dies I get it but here's the good news Friday is good because there was a Sunday Sunday made Friday Good Friday. There was a crucifixion verse, but then there was a resurrection. You hang out with a lot of people who call themselves Christians. You walk inside a lot of churches, and they forgot that there was a resurrection, that Jesus is alive. And that's who we're here for. He's the one that's deserving of all our attention, all of our affection, all of our passion, all of our praise, all of our worship. He is worthy of it all because he is the greatest reality that there's ever been. It's the greatest story that's ever been told. It's the greatest story that all other great stories borrow from is the story of Jesus. Uh, um, this last week, uh, both, both of my kids are all about superheroes right now. And my five-year-old Isaac, uh, this last week, uh, he refused to let us or his teachers call him Isaac. He said, no, my name is now Clark Kent. And because uh, <laughs> we love those stories. That's the deal. Like, he loves the stories. We love the stories. We love uh, to be a part of those stories. We want to be a part of those where it seems like the hero is defeated, but then he comes back and he wins. Now, every single one of those stories borrows from the greatest story, the greatest reality that there's ever been, Jesus Christ. And that's who we're here for. That's who we're here to celebrate, the fact that Jesus is undefeated. And that is good news. So Welcome. What we're going to do today, uh, we're going to kind of hang uh, here uh, on a book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. And uh, it's, if you brought your Bible, why don't you go ahead and kind of thumb over there. If you didn't bring your Bible, we're going to have it up on the screens. If you don't have a Bible, we will give you one before you leave. It looks like this. Uh, so here's the reality when it comes down to uh, the Bible. The Bible is not a word of man about God. The Bible is God's word to man. Uh, we weren't smart enough to figure him out, so he told us about himself and is found right here. And uh, the Bible is not irrelevant. It's never been uh, more relevant. The Bible is not outdated. It is timeless. Uh, uh, friends come and go, and governments come and go, and critics come and go, and critiques come and go, and challenges come and go, but the Word of God endures forever. And this thing will be here to the very end. And uh, we're going to kind of land on that uh, in our time here today. We're just going to kind of land on one chapter of the entire Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. And what's happened here, uh, uh, this guy who we call the Apostle Paul, uh, maybe you've heard that name before. Paul uh, was a great man, a great persecutor of the church that God absolutely, completely revolutionized his life. We'll find out a little bit more about him in a few minutes. But he wrote a letter to a church in a place called Corinth. And that's how we get Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to land there on 1 Corinthians 15. And what Paul is doing here uh, in this uh, one particular chapter is he's addressing the reality that many people doubted that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They thought that Jesus was dead. They thought he was defeated. They thought he was just a man who died. Now he's in a tomb somewhere. And, and I don't know where you kind of fall in that spectrum of belief. Maybe you're in here, you're doubt. Maybe you kind of uh, side with the, the, the uh, popular Muslim belief that kind of like God created somebody who looked like Jesus and they crucified him and Jesus kind of escaped crucifixion and he went on uh, to live somewhere else. Uh, maybe you're in here and you just 
just believed that Jesus was just a man. Maybe he was a good man. Maybe he was, an, he was even a prophet, but he's now dead, and he's buried, and he's in a grave somewhere. And Paul re realizes that, and he was writing a letter to people to address that, to say, hey, if that's true, if Jesus is dead and defeated, if Jesus didn't rise, if there was no resurrection, if there was no good news on Sunday, then here's what that actually means. And we find that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And he says, if Christ has not been raised, in other words, if Jesus is dead and defeated, then all our preaching is useless. I'm going to pause here real quick. You might already agree with that statement. And that's why you don't come to church very often. You think preaching is useless. You just think, hey, what's the big deal? Why do we need this thing? And, and wherever you're following that, but, but here's the reality. If Jesus is dead and defeated, then we're just wasting our words. Literally millions of missionaries throughout the years have wasted their lives. What we do in here on the weekends, what we're doing this morning, what literally millions and hundreds of millions of people all around the world are doing every single week is completely wasted time. He says, if Jesus is dead and defeated, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. He's saying it's just wasted time. There's so many people, literally hundreds of millions of people throughout the years have wasted their lives. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. He's saying we'd be lying because here's the deal. The New Testament authors, they say, we saw Jesus alive. And then we saw him dead, and then we saw him alive again. You know what I'm saying? Like, boop, 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 boop. You know, like, that's, that's what they saw. They saw Jesus on the cross. They saw him die, put him in the tomb. Then they saw him again, and they wrote about it. And they say, if Jesus isn't alive, then we're all liars. This is a lie, and Christianity is the biggest farce in human history. That's what he's saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. He says, if Jesus is dead and defeated, then so are you. He says, all the guilt, all the shame, all the sin, all the condemnation, all the depression, all the, all the life crushing down on you, it's yours to bear alone. It's yours because Jesus is in the grave. He says, in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. This is probably the most sobering part. What he's saying is if Jesus is dead and defeated, then there will come a day. And I, you know, I hate to be the one. I'm always the one who gets to do this. I get to rain on your parade and say you're going to die someday. So I don't know if you really woke up this morning expecting to hear that. We're all going to die. Can we just face that? At some point, we have to do that. And he's saying if Jesus is dead and defeated, then every single one of us, your brother, your friends, your neighbor, the person sitting next to you, husband, wife, coworkers, every single one of us one day will stand before the throne of an almighty mighty, all-knowing creator Jehovah God, the one who knows all things. He knows every single wicked thing that you ever did, knows every lustful thought that you've ever had, knows every addiction that you've ever set your hand to, knows every lustful thing, knows every sexual morality, knows all the pornography, knows all the lying and the cheating and the stealing. He knows all the dirtiness you've ever been involved in or thought about, all the hatred, all the wrath and the backbiting and the gossip, and you will stay and before him absolutely alone and there will be no grace and there will be no mercy there will only be judgment for your rebellion and if Jesus is dead and defeated then every single one of us is standing squarely in the path of the wrath of God and if our hope in Christ is only for this life we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world saying if Jesus is dead and defeated guys we're a bunch of idiots especially these guys you understand there's no like prosperity theology back then you know what I'm saying like the, like the Peter's not like calling an altar call and people are like running up and throwing money on the stage you know what I'm saying like 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 you know Peter didn't drive like a camel Bentley you know what I'm saying like, like he didn't have the engraved thing and the cufflinks and all you know they, they, they didn't have those things back then because if you said you were a Christian heads were rolling if you say Jesus is God, you're getting crucified like him, maybe upside down like Peter. You're getting beheaded. You're getting dipped in boiling oil. They're throwing you off buildings. They're cutting you in half. I mean, this is nasty stuff that's happening to these guys. I looked it up uh, last year, 2013. Last year, over 100 million Christians were persecuted around the world. In fact, at least, at least on the low end, 10,000 Christians were martyred last year. Last year. And if Jesus is dead and defeated, then we as the people of God have suffered way too much for a dead man. 
And maybe you kind of believe that. Maybe you just say, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just here. You know I mean? I just kind of popped in, you know, this Easter to see what this church thing is all about. I don't, I don't really believe in the whole Jesus thing. I'm just here. But I got good news for us today. Wherever you're at, Paul doesn't leave us in that place. Paul goes on the next verse. He says this in verse 20. I love it. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. What he's saying in here, it says it in another place that Jesus is the firstborn from among the grave. In other words, Jesus didn't just like say, hey, peace out. I'm like alive and you're all like lost forever. He said, I'm the firstborn. I started this thing. I started the ball rolling. Since I'm alive, you can be alive. Since I'm victorious, you can be a part of my victory as well. He says he's the firstborn from among the grave. That since he's alive, we can be alive. That death doesn't have the final say. We can stare in the face of death and say, where, oh, death is your victory where oh death is your sting that it's been swallowed up in the victory of Jesus Christ that's good news and what Paul does here what Paul does here he wants us to rewind back we're just going to go back to verse 1 here in the same chapter 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, basically what he does he lays out what this thing called Christianity is really all about what it takes to believe in, in, in this and so maybe you've had that question before again maybe you're here with us every single week uh, uh, maybe you're, you're invited maybe you're a coworker, neighbor uh, maybe you just kind of pop into church every once in a while and it's Easter so you said I'm going to go on out uh, I don't know how you got in here uh, but, but this is the word I think that God has for us uh, this morning we find it in 1 Corinthians 15 1 and Paul tells us what Christianity is really all about He says, now, brothers and sisters, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Just stop right there. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. What we're talking about many times in church is a reminder uh, to to many of us. But let me tell you, a reminder can be a very good thing, can't it? Like, I I got kids, you know, maybe if you got kids, have you ever, have your kids ever come up to hug you and you're like, hey, 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 you already did that once. I got it. I'm good, you know? Maybe your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, maybe they come up to give you a little kiss or something. You're like, hey, 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 we already did that one time, remember? Like we said, I do, kissed on the lips, game over. You know, I'm like, I don't need any more reminders. I already told you I loved you when we got married. We, we already covered those bases. We don't need to do that again. No, a reminder can be a very good thing. And the gospel, the good news, that's what gospel means. The good news of Jesus is always a good reminder because it's always good news. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. In other words, you you put your life on this thing, on this good news. He says, by this gospel, by this good news, you're saved. That's good. He says, you're saved by the good news. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. And again, we'll stop right there. Um, Many of us, we, we don't like preaching, and I get it. You know, that's why many people avoid churches. They don't like the idea of there is right and there is wrong, and you're being told what to do, you know? And, and I get that, but here's the reality. Whether you realize it or not, every single one of us is preached to every single day, all day long. You drive down the street, there's a billboard telling you what to do. You're watching TV, it's telling you what to do. Listen to the radio, listen to the music. It's telling you what's right and what's wrong in their opinion. It's telling you what to do. You walk through the malls, it's telling you what to do. Everything around you all the time, coworkers, conversations, neighbors, they're telling you what's right, what's wrong, what you should put your life into. You should go to this school over there because that'll get you on the right path. You should buy this because it'll make you look cool and you'll be more accepted. You should think this way because if not, you're an outcast. You should do this, you should do that. You should think this way, you should buy this and everything all the time is always preaching to us so maybe the better question is this what sort of preaching are you going to listen to and what sort of preaching are you going to let in see here here's when it all kind of boils down to it it's my job to preach it's your job to decide I get to preach it I get to be I get to be a witness I get to I get to stand up here with microphone and say this and it's your job to decide So Paul says this, he says, I preached to you about it. He says, here's what I preached. And he says, here's what you have to decide on. That's that's the same challenge for us today. He says, here's what you have to decide on. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is the most important thing. If you're gonna believe anything, you gotta decide on this. This is the most important thing. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12, that's the disciples. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. That's a very Jewish way of saying they're dead. (laughs) Then he appeared to James, 
and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul did not have a, a, a birth defect. <laughs> what he's saying, we'll get into that in just a second. He's saying, I was abnormally born. That'll make sense in just a second. Here's what he tells us, just there, starting at the very beginning. He tells us this, that the undefeated Jesus, first thing is this, he kind of lays out a few things. The undefeated Jesus, one, is the Christ. That the undefeated Jesus is the Christ. That word Christ in Greek is Messiah in Hebrew. What he's saying is Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Christ, Christ, Christ. The Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah is the deliverer. The Messiah is the savior. The Messiah is the one sent from God to help us, to deliver us, to reach his hand out of the boat to the one who's drowning in the water and pull us back in. That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one sent from God to save us. You understand this. If you read through the New Testament, the, the story about Christ, you understand that Jesus got in trouble for the things that he did, but they killed him for the things that he said. Jesus got in trouble for the things that he did, like he healed people on the Sabbath. I say, but dude, hey, hey, you can't do that. But they killed him for what he said because he said one thing that they couldn't get past. He said, I'm God. They said, we can't get, let you get away with that one. He, he, would he would stand there and he would say things like, I and the Father are one. Uh, when when the, all, the, all the religious leaders were all gathered around, they're saying how great Abraham was, you know, the father of the Hebrew faith. And, and Jesus says, hey, guys, let me just tell you, before Abraham was even born, I am. And he went all the way back to the book of Exodus where God says, my name is I am. I just am that I am. You can't try and put a label on me. I am. And he calls himself that. He lets people worship him. When Peter says that you're the Messiah, the son of God, he affirms it. He says that my words will never pass away. He's equating himself with the word of God. He repeatedly and unashamedly says that he is God. And that's what we know, that he is the word of God made flesh. He's the Bible with skin on, that Jesus is God's word to us. And when he said that, the people couldn't get past it, that he was God, that he is the Christ. And let me just tell you this, the atheists who say that there is no God, they're wrong. There is a God, and his name is Jesus Christ. To the agnostics who say that God can't be known, God can be known, and his name is Jesus Christ. To the deists who say, well, there's a lot of gods, we just don't know which one is really God. We do know who's really God, and his name is Jesus Christ. To the universalists who say, hey, we all kind of got our own paths, all paths lead to God, and Muslims have their way, and Buddhists have their way, and Hindus have their way, and Christians have their way. Well, let me just tell you, you're right. All paths do lead to God, all but one lead to his judgment. Because there is one name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus the Christ. And a lot of people, they view that as exclusive. Oh, 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 there's only one way. No, no, no. There is a way. There is a way because without Jesus, we're all lost. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And without him, no one comes to the Father. There is a way. God didn't have to give away, but he gave us a way. And his name is Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. Second thing is this. First thing is Jesus is the Christ who died for our sins. Just like the scripture said. Jesus is the Christ who died for our sins. You know, on that Thursday night of Easter week, Jesus is gathered around that last supper table and he's breaking the bread and he's pouring the cup, that, that last communion time. Last Supper, and says that they stand up, and I love it. It says that they sing a hymn together. They sing a song together. It's just this intimate, kind of like final moment with all the disciples right there that they share together. It says then they set out, and um, they set out into the, the nighttime air there in Jerusalem, and they go outside the city walls, and they go down the Kidron Valley uh, up to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, I went there a few years ago, and, and I love that, that the Bible is not a fictional book full of fictional places about fictional people. The Bible is a very real book about real people in real places. And Jesus goes to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane uh, on the hill right there by the main city of Jerusalem. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's full of olive trees. And, and what they would do is they would, <coughs> they would take the olives off of these trees and they would take them back to this press where they, they would literally be crushed and, and the oil would be extracted and the life would literally be squeezed out of these olives. And that's what's beginning to take place 
with Jesus, literally the sins of the world, just the thought of, of having to drink that cup of, of, of the wrath of God, it's beginning to crush him. And he goes a few feet away from his disciples and he prays, he says, God, is there any way out of this? Is there any other way? And God says, no. And so he says, not my will, but your will be done. He says, I'll drink the cup. I'll take the wrath. I'll take the punishment for it all. And then the torches start coming up the side of the hill and it's Judas, and he's leading a, a band of uh, Roman soldiers, and they come, and they uh, arrest Jesus, and Judas comes up, and he kisses him on the cheek, and, and Jesus says, really, it's, it's how it's going to go down. You, you betray me with a kiss. And they handcuff Jesus, and they lead him off like a criminal, and they take him to a, a trial in the middle of the night. And let me just tell you, any trial that happens in the middle of the night is not a good trial. And they take Jesus there and all the religious leaders are there. All the people who hate Jesus are there in that room and trying to form this argument against him, but they can't get the witnesses to all line up. And so they just ask him, are you God? Are you the son of God? Are you the Messiah? And he says, yes, I am the son of God. And just one day you will see the son of man coming back, riding on the clouds at the right hand of Father Almighty. And they freak out and they tear the robes in anguish and they begin to beat him and they blindfold him and they begin to punch him and kick him and the blood begins to flow and it doesn't stop until Calvary. And then they lead him away to go and be flogged. They take him and they tie him up to this post and the executioner comes out with a cat of nine tails probably. And there at the end of it, it was a short uh, whip and at the end there were, there were metal balls and there were bone hooks and, and the metal balls, simultaneously the metal balls would tenderize the flesh and the metal and the bone hooks would, would sink in and so the, the skin's being loosened up so that the hooks can get in. And so as the, the whip rings down on Jesus' back, the hooks get in and Executioner makes sure it's in there really good. And then they would rip it back out. Many times, veins would be ripped, bones would go flying, arteries would be lacerated, uh, uh, organs would be, would, be, would be cut in half. It says by the time that they were done that Jesus was unrecognizable. It says then, they, then they, they pressed this crown of thorns down upon his head and they put a, a, a purple robe around his shoulders and, and they put a, a staff inside his hand and they begin to false worship and they're mocking him and then they take the, the, the staff from his hand and they begin to beat him over the head with it again and again and again and again and then they rip his beard out and they spit on his face. And then they put a cross beam on his back and they make him carry it to the place where he's gonna die, like a man digging his own grave. And when he gets there, they throw him down on the ground, they hold his hands down, they put the, the nails in the most sensitive nerve centers in the entire body, in the hands and in the feet. And they strip him naked. And they bring the cross up, probably slide it down into a hole, and this entire body begins shaking, convulsing, tendons probably ripping, beginning slowly to suffocate, in front of all his accusers, and there he is, over the course of several hours, he dies naked and ashamed in front of his mom. And then the sins of the world come down upon him. That at the cross, Jesus took the punishment for the child molester. That at the cross, Jesus took the punishment for the rapist, for the person who did that to you. Jesus took the punishment for all of our lies and all of our cheating and all of our lust. All the wrath that was stored up for genocide was aimed right at him. And it says that at the cross, that Jesus became sin for us. That the father couldn't even look at the son any longer because he said, I don't even know you. I don't recognize you. And there Jesus suffered hell. And he said, it is finished. And he breathed his final breath and he died right there. Why? Why did he do it? Why did Jesus go through all that? For our sins. For our 
sins. That Jesus the Christ died for our sins. Not because he had to. Not because he wanted to. Because it just had to be done. It had to be done. It had to be done. Jesus the Christ died for our sins. You understand that. that <coughs> many times we'll say, oh man, that... I said, it's no big deal, man. I'm forgiven. I live in forgiveness. It's no big deal. You understand that our sins, that your sins and my sins were so hideous in the eyes of God that Jesus had to die for them, that it required the death of God on a cross for us to be forgiven. Guys, we need to wake up to the reality that we are more wicked than we ever imagined and we are more loved than we ever dreamed. The good news is God is so good. The bad news is we are so bad. You know, I hear people all the time, they say, well, man, I'm a pretty good person. Oh, look at Joe, man, he's a good guy. No, he's not. There are no good ones. There was only one good one and we killed him. And re besides, the, the call isn't to be good. The call is to be godly. The bar isn't set at good. The bar is set at perfection. And let me give you some bad news today. You already lost. He says, if you commit one sin, it's like you committed all of them. I got bad news for you. You need a savior. But I got good news for you. You have one, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Because he died for our sins. For our sins. I got good news. God doesn't have to punish you for your sins because he already punished Jesus. And here's the reality. Maybe, maybe this is the sobering reality of this. Either Jesus suffered hell for you or you get to suffer hell for you, but you get no resurrection. Jesus the Christ died for our sins. Third thing is this. Jesus the Christ died for our sins and he was buried. He was buried. We know this part of the story, right? They take him down from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea had a tomb. They take him in, put him in the tomb. They roll the stone over the entrance. Jesus was buried. You know, here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to people being buried, you know where they are, right? More than likely, you know, like you went to the funeral, you, you probably make your way back there. You know, we know where Abraham's buried. Father of the Hebrew faith, the, this place uh, in Hebron, it's maybe about 10, 12 miles uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, it's the, the tomb of the patriarchs. That's where they believe he's buried. Abraham and Sarah and Isaac, uh, they're all buried right there. And you can go and see them, you know? No, not alive, but you can go see them. And uh, we, know, we know where Muhammad is buried. There's this big shrine, you know? We know where Buddha is buried, or at least parts of them. There's a place where you can go see Buddha's tooth if you're into that sort of thing. You know, I mean, you, you can go and see Buddha's tooth. I mean, you know, we, we know where Confucius is buried. We know where these guys are buried. But here's the, here's the reality. We don't know where Jesus is buried. You want to know why? He's not buried. Because Jesus is alive. The Jews knew where Jesus was buried. The Romans knew where Jesus was buried. The disciples knew where Jesus was buried. The women on Sunday morning knew where Jesus was was buried. Joseph of Arimathea gave the tomb. He knew where he was buried, but they go there to get him, and he's not there. You want to know why? Because he's in Jerusalem having lunch. Because Jesus is alive. They're out there looking for him, and he's in town having lunch. You want to know why? Because Jesus is risen. The undefeated Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was risen. Number four, he was risen. You know, he goes into town and he does the thing in typical Jesus fashion. You know what I'm saying? Like disciples are in there all scared and afraid. Jews are going to come get him. And Jesus goes, oh, you know, and he comes through the wall and they're like, oh, what? What is happening? And they're like, um, can we do anything for you, Jesus? And he says, actually, guys, you have no clue how many calories it takes to defeat hell. Can I get some fish? And so they make him some fish, and he's like, and they're all like, because we saw him die, and now he's eating in the living room. What in the world? Jesus is alive. See, you remember on that day that uh, uh, there was, uh, on the crucifixion, there was a thief on the left, right, and a thief on the right. But I, I got news for you. Nobody's meeting this weekend to celebrate those guys. 
Nobody's mean this weekend to talk about how great the thieves were. You want to know why? Because they're dead. But Jesus is alive. On the third day, the stone rolled away. Breath entered back into his body, and he stood back up on his feet, victorious and undefeated, that Jesus is alive. <laughs> Jesus the Christ died for our sins. He was buried, he rose again, and he appeared to many. Jesus appeared to many. That's the last thing, the fifth thing. The undefeated Jesus appeared to many. It actually says that he appeared to people over 40 days. And, and here's the reality when we get to that part. Um, I don't know about you, but if I'm making up a story, I'm going to be like, hey, you just missed him. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was just here. You know what I'm saying? Like, it says that Jesus appeared to Peter. If I'm making up this story, just, just go with me. I mean, if this is a human story, like many people think it is, if this is a human story, I'm saying, hey, Jesus appeared to Peter, and then Peter came back and told us all about it. I guess it's true, right? Like, like, like Jesus told one guy, and that guy told everybody else, and we started a religion based on it. No, it says that Jesus appeared to Peter. Peter was the leader of the disciples. Jesus first appeared to Peter, and it says that he ate with them, hung out with them. I mean, they, these guys are like going fishing together. I mean, it's like old times. They're hanging out. As Jesus first appears to the leader, he appears to Peter, and then it says that he appears to the, to the other disciples, um, then uh, to the followers. And, and you know who else he appeared to? He appeared to Thomas. You know who Thomas was? Even if you don't know the Bible, you know who Thomas was. It's the guy who doubted it. You know, it's like, it's like he, he like showed up. You know, Jesus walks through. He appears to them. He eats the fish. They hang out for a little bit. Gives them some really cool things about heaven. And then he like walks right back through the wall. And then comes in Thomas. And everybody's like, and Thomas is like, what's, what's going on? What did I miss? And like, Jesus was just here. He's like, ah, I doubt it. I doubt it. Forever telling us that you shouldn't be late for church. You just never know. Jesus might have just been here right before you got here. I'm just saying. And so, so Tom, Thomas says, hey, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe that he's alive until I actually touch the holes in his hand, touch the holes in his feet, touch the gash in his side where they place a spear through and struck his heart. I'm not going to believe it unless I see that. And here's what I love. Jesus shows back up. And he says, hey, Thomas, it's okay. Come on. You can touch. You can touch. Come place your hands, come touch your, your fingers and, and the holes in my hands. Come feel the gash in my side. It's okay. See, here's, here's some news for us this morning. Jesus isn't afraid of your doubt. The Bible isn't so, so man-made that you can poke holes in it like that. See, Jesus says, Thomas, it's okay if you doubt. God's not afraid of doubt. Yeah, absolutely. We always quote that, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Yeah, but the guys who have seen it and believe it are blessed too because they get saved too. See, Jesus appears to the leader. Jesus appears to the followers. And Jesus appears to the doubters. And he puts himself out there. He says, I'm not hiding. I'm right here. If you want to come and challenge it, come and challenge it. And that's the reality. Countless thousands and millions of people have tried to challenge this thing over the years. And let me just give you some, some news. Most of them end up getting saved when they read it. They set out to disprove it, and they read it. See, when it comes to the Bible, I love this quote that uh, I don't have to defend the Bible. I just let the lion out of the cage. It's God's word to man. So Jesus appears to the leader, and Jesus appears to the disciples, and then Jesus appears to the doubters, and then it says that Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. And again, if this is my story, I'm not putting that 500 mark on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you tracking with me? Like, uh, like it's 500 sounds, I mean, that's about like how many people we have in here. I mean, there's probably a little bit more. And so we, we think, well, that's, that's not that many. Back then, that might as well have been 25,000 people because villages were like 75 people, maybe 100 people. And so really, literally at one moment, five villages have all come together to come and listen to Jesus, to see Jesus alive at one moment. So Jesus appears to the leader and Jesus appears to the followers and Jesus appears to the doubters and Jesus appears to the masses. And then it says, Jesus appears to James. And we kind of have to pause right there because it's really easy to overlook that. But here's what you got to understand. James is Jesus's little brother. Jesus appears to his little brother and his little brother believes that he's God. Let me ask you a question. How many out there you got a brother? Okay. 
what would it take for you to believe that he's God? <laughs> what would it take for you to believe that that idiot is sinless? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what would it take to get you over that hump to say, all right, I actually believe it now. You know what I'm saying? Like, what would it take? Uh, you tell, my, my parents are actually here. My parents come to the church quite often. And um, uh, my mom would tell you that I'm a sinner. And if she wouldn't, my dad would. And if he wouldn't, my sister would. And if my sister wouldn't, my brother definitely would. He has the scars emotionally and physically <laughs> to prove that I am a sinner. And here's the, here's the deal. When it comes to your family, they're the ones who have the rap sheet on you, right? They're the ones who've known you the whole time. They're not just the ones who know you from the stage or like you're feeding the 5,000 people on the hillside and everybody's like, oh, Jesus is so great. And they're, not, they're like, hey, but you should have known them when, you know, like the, they're the ones who could have come forward with that sort of thing. In fact, we see that Jesus is teaching people and they say, hey, Jesus, your, your brother and your mothers, your sisters, they're, they're all out there. They come to get you. And here's what happened. I'm sure the conversation at home was like, hey, Jesus has a Messiah complex and we got to go and do an intervention. We got to go and get this guy, bring him back home. You ever had a family member kind of like went out into left field like, like that? They're going to get Jesus and bring him back because they don't believe. But when James sees Jesus alive, James believes. And I love that. It actually tells us that the Mary who was there, Mary, his mom who was there, sees him die, sees him alive. She's actually there on the day of Pentecost and she gets filled with the Holy Spirit. His family is all in. James and Jude, Jesus' two little brothers, wrote books of the Bible. If anybody has reason to doubt, it's your little brothers. I think of nothing else that tells us Jesus is alive. So lastly, Jesus appeared to Paul. He says, as, as one abnormally born, if you don't know this story about, about Paul, Paul, before his name was Saul, and Saul was the greatest persecutor of the early church, Saul murdered Christians in the name of God. He said, these guys, these guys who are Jewish are saying that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's God. We can't let them get away with that. Let's go murder them. And so he's actually there at the first stoning of the first martyr, of the first Christian. He's there. He's overseeing the whole thing. And then he goes on a rampage all over the, the, the countryside, killing Christians. And Jesus appears to him on this place called the Damascus Road there in Syria and knocks him off his horse. And Jesus radically changes his life. He changes his name first to Paul and then he changes his life. And the greatest persecutor of the church became the greatest pastor of the church because he met Jesus. Jesus appears to the leader. Jesus appears to the followers. Jesus appears to the doubters. Jesus appears to the masses. Jesus appears to those who are closest. And Jesus appears to his enemies. And I think for us today, we could say all of us are somewhere in that spectrum. Leader, follower, doubter, enemy, friend, family. And Jesus says, hey guys, it's okay. It's okay, I'm undefeated. I'm alive. See, there is a God, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is one who conquered the grave, and his name is Jesus. There is a king who reigns over the living and the dead, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is a victorious one who conquered the grave, and his name is Jesus. There is a one who took all the sins and is able and willing and glad to give forgiveness. And he is glad to wash away your past. And he is glad to wash away your doubt. And he is glad to wash away your condemnation and your self-sitterness and your self-pity and all your shame and all oh, woe is me. He's glad to wash it all away. He's glad to wash away all the wickedness, all the unrighteousness, all the evil thoughts. He's so glad to redeem your past, to give you a future, and to revolutionize your present because he's the only one who is able and his name is Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. And Paul says this final thing here. I love it. He writes another letter to a church in Rome. And I love it. It's for us today. Romans 8 verse 11. He says it stands to reason, doesn't it, 
that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from the dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. That's good news. He's saying that because Jesus is alive, you can be alive. Because he has life, you can have life. That you can make a break with your old man and you can come back to life. You understand that, that the only thing that Jesus has ever left behind is the tomb. And he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. The old man was left behind in the same way when you say, Jesus, I receive it. I get the forgiveness. I'm all in. I want your way of life. The old man is left behind as well. And that's good news. Let me just tell you, it's my job to preach and it's your job to decide. And now is the moment of decision. Maybe you're in here and you'd say, man, I've just kind of been doing my own thing. I've just kind of been living my own life, call myself a Christian, not really. Maybe you just say, I don't even want anything to do with Jesus. But today, it's just kind of an aha moment. You say, I want to be all in. Maybe, maybe you say, I, I, I do the Christmas and Easter thing. Maybe, maybe I'm here from the community. Maybe I just kind of pop into church every once in a while. I don't want to be that sort of person anymore. I don't want to play patty cake with God anymore. I want to be all in. Because if that's real, if, if Jesus really is alive, guys, it changes everything. You understand that, right? You can't just kind of like pray a prayer like, oh, I'm a Christian now and go out and live exactly the same way. Because when Jesus is alive, that life enters into you and it changes things. So I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to just kind of bow your heads. Once you close your eyes, just kind of hang in this moment here just for a second. This is the same process I went through in my life. And let me just tell you, there, there are kind of a handful of moments that you look back to and just say that that's the moment that, that changed things. That was the, the fork in the road that since I took that way, it changed everything. It changed the course of my life. Let me just tell you, I grew up in church. My dad was the pastor amazing man of God. One time, this guy got up on stage with a microphone and he talked about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And I just got it. It, I had heard it before, but I just, it clicked. It was my aha moment. I just got it. And maybe today that's you. Maybe you're just saying, I've heard it before, but I never heard it. I never actually, it had never actually gotten in. Maybe today, by God's grace, it got in. He said, I want in. I went into this new life, say, I don't have all the answers. I don't, I, I, I can't even tell you one verse of the Bible. I, I don't, the good news is this. God doesn't ask you to clean your, you clean yourself up and then come to him. He says, come as you are. He said, and I'll change you along the way. If you're in here today and you say, I, I want in, wherever you're at in that spectrum, I, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And here's the deal with the prayer. It's not about just, just saying some words. It's nothing magic about words. What it is, the words are an expression of what's going on inside your heart. And if you believe this, if you say it with your mouth, it says that you'll be saved because of the good news of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, won't you, won't you pray this prayer with me and believers around these guys, you can commit yourself to this again as well. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, the Christ who died for my sins, who was buried, who was risen, (laughs) appeared to many, that you're alive. And right now, I turn from my past, all the guilt, the shame, the pity, the darkness, the condemnation. God, I leave the old life behind to have the Jesus life. I turn towards you. God, forgive me. God, wash me, make me clean and make me new, all because of Jesus. Right now, I confess Jesus Christ is my King and He's my Savior. And for the rest of my days, I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank God for that right now. (sighs) And just tell you this, something amazing just happened inside you. If you prayed that maybe for the first time or maybe you just prayed it for the first time and really meant it, maybe something clicked inside you. And uh, the great, amazing, radical, life-shaking news is it says that, that, that when uh, uh, even one comes to faith in Christ, it says there's a party in heaven. 
I love that about God. We kind of have this idea that God is this old man on a rocking chair, you know, on a, just like angry at us. God's, uh, God's word says that he rejoices over us with shouts of joy. He says he delights in you. He dances over your life. That's the God that you have. And now he's no longer this, this, this kind of mystical figure. He calls himself father. He wants to be a dad to you. That's the amazing family that you just entered into. And what we're going to do in just a second, we're going to ask you to kind of take a next step of that. If you really meant business with God this morning, God's doing a work in your life. We're going to ask you to kind of take a next step. But before we do that, we want to uh, participate in something together. Is, is the family of God in here. And people have been doing for literally 2,000 years. We're going to take communion together. And so uh, if you're at the end of an aisle, there's uh, buckets down there. I want you to kind of reach down and pass that down. And so if you, uh, if you say today, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, or today I pray that prayer, I've never taken communion, or uh, wh wherever you're at, um, we invite you to, to take in this with us. If you want Jesus. This bread symbolizes his body and the cup symbolizes his blood. If you say, I want to I take that into my life, we invite you to participate with us. So that Thursday night, um, just a few hours before he was crucified, dead and buried, Jesus broke the bread and he said these shaking words. He says, this is my body broken for you. It didn't really make sense to them until a few hours later when they saw his body being broken for them. And this is good news for us, that because Jesus' body was broken, ours doesn't have to be. That's really good news. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to have a good understanding of what you did for us. So God, right now, we thank you that the body of Jesus Christ was broken for us. God, that the stripes that should have been on our back were placed on your back. God, the brokenness that should have been ours was placed on you. Thank you for taking that for us. And so, God, right now, by the power of the stripes on the back of Jesus, by your broken body, God, I speak healing over your people. God, I thank you, God, that by the broken body of Jesus Christ, God, it is our healing. Let's not forget the Lord and all his benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all of our diseases. God, right now, we come against cancer. God, we come against allergies. God, we come against arthritis and Alzheimer's and dementia, diabetes. God, we come against any disorder of the mind, depression, uh, God, or, or the bones uh, or the blood. God, we come against that and we speak healing. We say, be healed in Jesus' name. And we take this bread right now, God, your body, and we do it in remembrance of you. Amen. Let's take the bread. That same night, Jesus poured the cup. He said, this is the new covenant between you and God. In other words, it's not about your works. It's not about doing enough good things, and God finally has to let you in. He says, it's about my blood. He said, that's, that's what gets you in. That's what gets you into the family of God. That's what cleanses you and washes you as white as snow. It's the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you laid down your life for us so you're freely able to take it back up again. God, we thank you that you so loved the world, that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. And it's only possible because of the blood of Jesus. For the forgiveness of our sins that makes us new, cleanses us, makes us whole again. And right now we take this cup and we do it in remembrance of you. Let's take the cup. 